And I call Gordon Lindhurst to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Uh, ten minutes, please, Mr Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Last spring, the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee undertook an inquiry into the economic impact of the gender pay gap in Scotland. We heard from a large range of witnesses, and I would like to thank everyone who gave us their views during the inquiry. Whether in written evidence, Twitter stories, case studies, formal meetings or committee visits, all of these helped inform our inquiry and shape the report. Now, this may sound slightly controversial, but we were, of course, well aware that we were by no means the first to attempt to tackle the subject. However, we wanted to try and look at the issue from an economic point of view, to understand potential benefits to Scotland's economy if there were parity of earnings. First, it is important to attempt to clarify what we mean by the gender pay gap. As has been highlighted, a common misconception can be that it is about men and women being paid the same for equal work. But the gender pay gap is not the same as equal pay. In 1970, the Equal Pay Act introduced as a legal right the requirement that women should be paid equally for doing the same or comparable work. It was a disappointment to the committee to hear that despite over 40 years having passed, this has still not been resolved and live claims remain outstanding against employers who are considered to discriminate on grounds of gender. If the gender pay gap is not defined in the same way as equal pay, what is it? How is it measured? The committee found that calculating the pay gap is not a straightforward task. Most commonly, it is carried out by a comparison of the hourly earnings of men and women. But unlike other labor market indicators such as unemployment, there is no internationally recognized definition of the pay gap. This means that in Scotland, the pay gap can vary from 6% to 33%, depending on which measure is used. This made it difficult drawing comparisons between Scotland and other countries. Now, to be consistent with the UK Office for National Statistics, or ONS, the Scottish Government uses the full-time median pay gap, which compares median hourly earnings of full-time male and full-time female workers. The Scottish Government measure, however, excludes part-time workers, and in doing so, 42% of female workers in Scotland, and 75% of part-time workers are women, with 42% of women more working part-time compared to 13% of men. So, without including part-time workers when calculating the gender pay gap, it is to be questioned whether the result uh, of the measure used by the Scottish Government fairly represents the Scottish workforce. So the committee has accordingly urged the Scottish Government to change the way it measures and reports the gender pay gap in its national performance framework to take into account part-time workers. As a result, the Scottish Government has at least committed to including additional information on Scotland performs to show the position for part-time workers uh, and that is to be welcomed. Rather than just look at the gender pay gap, the committee wanted to look at possible implications it has for the Scottish economy. So the committee heard evidence from a range of witnesses who spoke to the potential economic benefit of increasing women's participation by reducing the gender pay gap. Further Scotland-specific and detailed research does need to be carried out, however. We do know that women across our economy continue to be concentrated in low-paid industries and part-time work. They can be impacted at all stages of their working lives and not solely as a result of choosing to start a family or to take time out of their careers. And it is particularly important in the committee's view to note the care sector and its importance in our society. It is the committee's view that the care sector, including child care and adult and elderly care, is an undervalued but growing and central part of Scotland's economy. And it is not just about child care. Care as a sector is also representative 
of many of the reasons for the existence of the gender pay gap. The sector is dominated by women and is traditionally low paid. Social care needs a more diverse workforce. It needs to be valued as a sector. It needs to be better paid. In its recommendations, the committee recognized the impact that improving pay in child, adult, and elder, elderly care would have, not only on reducing the gender pay gap, but also on recruiting a more balanced workforce. And that balance, we heard, can have a real and meaningful impact. During the course of the inquiry, Members of the committee had the pleasure of visiting numerous businesses and the experiences gained from those visits are reflected in the report and its recommendations. Uh, just a few examples. Some members visited Home Sweet Home, which is a domestic cleaning agency working with self-employed cleaners. 95% of their workforce is female and the agency recommends payment of the living wage as a minimum. But the 5% who are male often undertake the higher paid jobs. One of the other visits was to Men in Child Care, a Scottish Government initiative um, and Edinburgh Council funded initiative aimed at encouraging men into child care. Again, child care is normally a sector which is primarily um, peopled by female workers. But the men on this visit spoke positively of the reception they had experienced from families of children they worked with. They highlighted the need for more men to show an interest in the profession. Encouraging men into childcare and supporting both women and men with wages that show the importance of care could have real benefits beyond the purely economic. I would also like to highlight the importance of flexible, agile and part-time working. The committee found that even if employers are actively looking to assist women in re-entering the workforce, they may struggle with the provision of part-time jobs and flexible working. The committee heard that in the UK, around 8% of roles advertised with a salary of over £20,000 per annum offer some sort of flexible working. But flexible working can be important for different reasons and at different career stages. Without the opportunity of flexible working, women can lose out in the jobs market and we can all lose out on what their skills provide for us. The committee has heard evidence of the business benefits of offering agile and flexible working and notes that good practice of companies can positively influence maternity return rates at an appropriate time. In recent years, some companies have introduced programs to encourage people back into the workforce after a career bake, break, sorry, career break, not bake. For some, this is a return to work after maternity leave, but not exclusively. The committee has heard that one of the key points at which women drop out of the workforce is after a career break, often to care for children. We were encouraged to hear that businesses and organizations have been finding innovative ways of supporting employees to return to the workforce and retrain with the assistance of appropriate mentoring. The Scottish Government's support of returners programmes and its commitment to learn from best practice and work with partner projects is to be welcomed. The committee recognises that different solutions may be needed for different sectors and that approaches to returners programmes should be tailored accordingly. There is a host of arguments as to why the gender pay gap should be addressed. I have, of course, only had the opportunity in this short speech to cover a few key points and a few of the aspects of the report which the committee produced. But the subject is a very complex and wide-ranging one. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, in its written evidence on its own gender pay gap situation, as independently audited, revealed a 0% pay gap across its staff groups. But that pay equality actually varied at different levels within its organization. So there is work to be done. This is why the committee recommended in its report that the Scottish government, pro government produce an overarching strategy to address the gender pay gap, including an action plan and measurable targets. I note that the Scottish Government will undertake a scoping exercise to see if a coordinated cross-government action plan is feasible. 
The whole committee no doubt looks forward to seeing the result. In conclusion, with the political will, we can move forward in a balanced and appropriate manner to address this issue. It's a matter of fairness to all. Thank you. I now call Jamie Hepburn. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to uh, members of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for uh, the report we debate today and the chance, indeed, to uh, debate it. I welcome the work they've undertaken to, to build uh, a better understanding of the drivers and reasons for the, the prevalence of the gender pay gap in Scotland. The written submissions received by the committee and evidence sessions, they've heard all underline what a, a complex issue uh, this is. But this government does not shy away from issues uh, based on their complexity. And we are determined to reduce gender inequality and improve the position of women in the workplace and indeed in all aspects of Scottish life. Our uh, recently launched programme for government sets out our plan to shape the kind of Scotland we all seek, an inclusive, fair, prosperous, innovative country ready and willing to embrace uh, the future. And as part of that, our, our strong commitment to equality is at the core of Scotland's economic strategy. Closing the gender pay gap is a priority, both in terms of uh, the promotion of equality, but also just as fundamentally boosting inclusive economic growth. And, and Scotland is uh, making positive progress. The overall uh, pay gap in Scotland, which reflects all workers full and part-time, currently stands at 15.6%, down from 20.4% in 2007. The full-time pay gap in 2016 was 62.0%, lower than the UK figure of 9.4%, and down from 11.9% in 2007. Too high, but still a uh, progress. Uh, but we must do more. And that obviously allows me to mention uh, the point that has been raised by uh, Gordon Lindhurst in terms of issues uh, around measurement. He, he is quite right to reflect that there is no uh, single international uh, standard. In re relation to the uh, committee's request, uh, we have responded. We ha will uh, set out a publication of a wider range of information about the nature of the gender pay gap on a range of different measurements uh, in uh, Scotland uh, performs. I think, of course, the fundamental thing, uh, President Officer, is that no matter the measurement, we want to see it moving in a positive direction, and that has been the case here in Scotland. But, of course, we want to see it uh, come down further still. Uh, the evidence uh, provided during the inquiry has reinforced much of what we know about the main drivers of the gender pay gap, and it's confirmed there is no a single a solution uh, to closing it. We agree with the committee that high quality evidence and analysis is vital to underpinning effective and inclusive policy uh, making in uh, Scotland. We are therefore taking uh, real steps to walk forward in improving our gathering and communication of data. Just last week, we, we published a working paper on the development of a gender index uh, for Scotland. Uh, we uh, will now uh, engage uh, in meaningful dialogue uh, with uh, those who have an interest in the matter as we take this uh, work forward to its conclusion. We're already planning uh, an, a, a, a workshop for later uh, this autumn to discuss how to take this forward alongside other uh, data gaps highlighted in the recently published equality evidence uh, strategy. Uh, we must also uh, use that data as we seek to improve it and what we already know about underrepresentation of women in traditional male-dominated careers to guide our approach. For example, we know that women are still underrepresented in science, technology, engineering and mathematics careers. And, but even within the sectors where women are well represented, such as in finance and law, occupational segregation prevents women from progressing to senior management uh, positions. Uh, and also in that regard, we pick up on the point and agree with the point that was made uh, by Gordon Lindhurst that equally we need to also be taking uh, steps to diversify uh, the workforce in uh, the care sector. We need more men to enter uh, that uh, sector. And also we need to make sure those working in that sector are adequately remunerated. That's why we've committed to ensuring those working in adult social care and early years child care are paid uh, the living wage. Uh, segregation uh, in, the, uh, in the workplace, gender stereotyping and discrimination starts at an early age. Incidentally, that's why it's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to ensure more men work in early years childcare so young boys uh, have that uh, role model they can look to and understand that it's just as much a career for uh, them as it is their female 
uh, counterparts. But it's also why we've been developing our STEM strategy and why we'll be publishing, which we will be publishing shortly, and it's why we are uh, implementing the developing the young workforce uh, strategy. Uh, in partnership with Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Founding Council, we have set targets to increase the gender minority share in the most imbalanced college subject groups and modern apprenticeship frameworks by 2021. We know uh, that I've seen it all too often when I'm out and about uh, that a, a modern apprenticeship can be a life-changing opportunity for a young person. That's why we're uh, committed to expanding the reach of that opportunity to tackling uh, gender imbalances and promoting equality uh, of uh, access through uh, the work of developing young workforce, the Modern Apprenticeship Equality Action Plan and the Scottish Funding Council Gender Action Plan. We have set out a number of ways we aim to uh, ensure that young people can uh, be uh, supported with their subject and career choices. Uh, since my appearance before the Committee Skills Development Scotland have now published their Equality Action Plan Year One update. Overall, there have been improvements to the number of uh, modern apprenticeship frameworks with the gender balance is greater than 75-25 from 74% in 2015-16 to 70% in 2016-17. This is welcome progress, but of course, again, we must see uh, more. Uh, Skills Development Scotland are continuing to work uh, with a range of organisations to further improve the gender imbalance in the uptake of apprenticeship frameworks, and we will continue to support them to ensure that apprenticeship opportunities are open uh, to all. Uh, there is, of course, though, a clear need to make sustainable change to societal and cultural norms to achieve the inclusive growth we want to see. This is a long-term commitment, not one that we will achieve overnight. We need consistent commitment from every part of the system to make uh, this uh, lasting change and to make sure we tackle discrimination in the workplace. This government is committed to that agenda. That's why, President Officer, I chair a working group on pregnancy and maternity discrimination. That's why uh, we support a women returners programme, as mentioned by uh, Gordon Lindhurst. That's why uh, we have worked with TimeWise and we fund and take part in family-friendly uh, working in uh, Scotland. That's why we have got our Scottish Business Pledge. That's why we're rolling out uh, more early years childcare. It is uh, very much an agenda we are signed up to. It's not just a commitment for us all in the political sector, of course. This needs to be a societal commitment but the Chamber can be assured, the Committee can be assured, it is an agenda that we as a government are signed up to. Call on Dean Lockhart. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Lockhart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me start by thanking the clerks and others involved for their hard work in preparing the report on the gender pay gap. This is an important report. It deals with a complex topic that cuts across issues of fairness, equality and social justice, as well as the wider economic considerations such as low pay and skills development for women. The gender pay gap in Scotland is, or the UK is not unique to this country. It's a common feature of advanced and developing economies worldwide. In fact, the gender pay gap in Scotland, as the Minister said, stands at 6.2% for full-time employees and 15.6% for all employees and is at the lower end of the gender pay gap compared to many European uh, countries. However, more needs to be done to close the gap. And with this objective in mind, a major focus of the committee was to identify the underlying factors which caused the, the, the gap in pay. The committee looked in depth at a number of those factors, including occupational segregation, uh, in particular the underrepresentation of women in STEM and other highly paid occupations. For example, only 2% of in engineering jobs and 18% of digital technology jobs are carried out by women. The opposite is true when it comes to lower paid sectors where there's an over concentration of female workers. For example, Scottish uh, Care in evidence to the committee told us that 86% of their uh, workers were women. Other factors heard in evidence include the low levels of women who reach senior management within organisations and women not returning to work after having children or not returning at the same level. Uh, with Ernst & Young telling us that working below skills level is an issue for women when they want to return to the workplace and the older women, women get, the harder that becomes. So Deputy Presiding Officer, in order to effectively address the gender pay gap, it's important that we look beyond the headlines, we look beyond the easy solutions and address these underlying issues. And that's what the committee has done by setting out a comprehensive set of recommendations. Time allows me only to highlight a, a few. First, we need to tackle the long-term factors that result in occupational segregation. 
The committee heard extensive evidence that key to tackling occupational segre segregation is encouraging more young women to enter high earning fields such as STEM related careers. Specific recommendations to address this include improved career guidance from primary school right through to tertiary education. There was a feeling that career guidance sometimes uh, is out of date with the opportunities available in the workforce and sometimes comes too late in uh, the career uh, uh, options of, uh, of pupils. And there's an emphasis of maximizing the uptake of women workers in STEM areas. Also addressing the gender imbalance in modern apprenticeships. And we welcome uh, the minister's plans and his announcement in this area. And there's also uh, a job to be done in encouraging men to enter uh, social care and other sectors heavily represented by female workers. Uh, the committee also recommends better support for women returning to work. This is addressed to some extent by government initiatives. The UK government has announced a £5 million fund to support this, and the Scottish government is support supporting this as well. But I think it's also incumbent on the private sector to establish effective returner programmes for women. The committee heard powerful evidence that the valuable knowledge and skills of experienced women are not fully uh, deployed when they return to work, and we simply cannot afford to lose this valuable talent in the workplace. We also need to consider the impact of the decline of female uh, participation at colleges and the impact this has had on supporting women back to the workplace. As Audit Scotland has reported, the fall in part-time college places has had a disproportionate impact on female students. The committee further recommended that the care sector, as Gordon Lindhurst mentioned, this care sector should become a Scottish Government priority sector, acknowledging the importance of this sector to Scotland's economy going forward and the increased spending that has been taking place and that will take place in this sector. Changing demographics mean future demands placed on the care sector will increase significantly and it's important we prioritise this to achieve a balanced workforce, improve productivity and uh, help make this sector fit for uh, future challenges ahead. The committee has also called for more analysis and information on the gender pay gap in Scotland. Again, something the minister touched on and we welcome working together with the government in that area because the gender pay gap itself varies according to a number of factors. It's not a static uh, one dimensional uh, problem. It varies according to age, social class and level of education. So the committee recommends that the Scottish Government uh, does more work in this area to analyse how we can address uh, the gap in Scotland. Uh, in this respect, the committee welcomed the UK Government's initiative for companies reporting on their gender pay gap. There was some concern expressed that the, the 250 uh, employee uh, threshold for reporting might not capture large parts of the SME economy in Scotland, but there was some concern raised by the CBI saying that any extension of mandatory reporting to companies in Scotland with less than 250 employees uh, would place a significant regulatory burden on those companies. Uh, so, Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, the Scottish Conservatives support steps to close the gender pay gap in Scotland. We agree with the committee's approach to deal with the underlying issues and not just the headlines or the outcomes. As the report itself concludes, there is recognition that the reasons for the gender pay gap are deep-seated and wide-ranging and need to be tackled across a number of policy areas, including education, skills, childcare, procurement and business support. We agree with this and we look forward to working with the Scottish Government to close the gap. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey up to six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Presiding officer, things have certainly changed since you and I were first elected to the Parliament in 1999. I'm delighted that I've been preceded by three men in this debate on um, the gender pay gap. The feminisation of debates in this Parliament continues apace. But, presiding officer, I am very proud that it was the Labour Party and Barbara Castle that introduced the Equal Pay Act in 1970, so that men and women receive equal pay for performing equal work. That, of course, followed on the Ford sewing machinist um, strike at Dagenham and fundamentally changed women's industrial history. And we've come a long way in almost 50 years, but there is much, much more work still to be done. Let us not, as the convener quite rightly pointed out, confuse equal pay with the gender pay gap. The gender pay gap in Scotland today stands at almost 16%, caused by a myriad of different complex and interconnected issues, which when you take them together, underline women's inequality in the labour market. It is the case that women are still more likely to be in low paid, 
part-time, low-skilled jobs. It is the case that women are underrepresented in senior management and leadership roles. And it is the case that women still have the majority of care duties, whether it's for children or indeed for older people. And if we maintain the snail's pace of change that we have just now, it will take another 140 years to close the pay gap. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't wait that long. I wouldn't live that long for a start, but I am impatient for change, not just for my generation, but my daughter's generation and the women who will follow her. But I'm impatient for that change for our economy too, because GDP figures announced today show that our economy grew in the last quarter, but by only 0.1%. And as night follows day, out came the press release from Keith Brown, claiming credit for the good news. The Scottish economy is teetering on the brink of a recession, and the Cabinet Secretary's response is breathtaking in its complacency. And you know, it matters now more than ever before, because lower growth rates between Scottish and UK governments will have an impact on our block grant because of the fiscal framework. So growing our economy is a fiscal imperative. Happy to give Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the member, and, and notwithstanding the long-standing green critique of economic growth as an overriding objective, does Jackie Bailey acknowledge that focusing in a narrow way on GDP itself fails to understand the different gendered aspects to economic work. Unpaid caring work, for example, does nothing for GDP. A great deal of that is done by women, whereas paid caring work is seen as contributing to GDP. It's a, it's a myopic analysis. Jackie Bailey. Um, as the member will appreciate, GDP is capable of comparison across different countries, but I absolutely accept the point that he makes that there should be you know, more quality to the statistical collections that we make that indicate what the gender pay gap is across the board. Um, but, but we do know that if growth suffers, there is a continuing pay gap. And over the course of a woman's working life, she will earn, on average, £456,518 less than a man. And that's a shocking statistic. What a lost opportunity. Because if we close the gender pay gap, we inject a staggering £17 billion into the Scottish economy. That's transformational for our economy, but it's transformational for women too. So it is imperative that we close the gap. The committee came up with a range of recommendations covering everything from a national strategy, flexible working, tacking occupational segregation to making care a priority growth sector. And let me say as gently as I can to the minister that the government's response is weak, it is timid. Where is the evidence of urgency, the evidence of momentum? Where is the evidence of political priority? And I hope the minister proves me wrong. And here is one area where he can do just that. Formally designating care as a key growth sector would be a small but welcome first step in addressing the undervaluation of care work. We know that the majority of staff in the care sector are female. The jobs are often part-time, low paid. As a society, we all understand the importance of care, and yet we do not value those that choose caring as a profession in their take-home pay. At the moment, it's the biggest, biggest, growth, biggest growth sector in employment terms than any other. And yet it is not on the radar of our enterprise agencies. And that needs to end. We know that childcare provision can be a real driver for economic growth, enabling parents to return to the workforce or increase their hours. And with the expansion of childcare, adult social care and older people's care, we need to address the skill so shortages and help the private and third sectors in the fields of investment, leadership, innovation and fair work. That is a job for our enterprise agencies. Our economic strategy moved towards a more inclusive definition of what's important to the Scottish economy. The care sector should be at the centre of that, supported by all that is best in our enterprise support structures. Now, I recognise that a first step has been taken by paying the real living wage to adult social care staff. But that doesn't apply overnight. It doesn't apply to childcare staff. And when health and social care partnerships are commissioning services, there are still issues for private and third sector care staff 
as costs are driven downwards. There is much still to do to value all of the workforce well and to shatter the glass ceiling for women. Presiding officer, a Labour government would be focused on reducing the gender pay gap, not on protecting the privileged few. We would increase the minimum wage to a real living wage of £10 per hour. And as part of our plan for rights and work, close, we Ms. would Bailey. ensure companies comply with gender equality legislation. The prize is great, Minister, for women and for our economy. We now move to the open debate and speeches of up to no more than six minutes, please. Ash Denham to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to begin my speech with just one of many, many workplace discrimination stories that I've heard from my female friends um, over the years. One was a middle manager in an IT services firm, and she'd worked for the same firm for 12 years, working her way up to managing the most prestigious account that the team had. Um, but when she told her boss that she was pregnant, she was immediately removed from that account and told that she would then have to spend the rest of her time before she went off on maternity leave, training up her male replacement. When she returned from maternity leave, not only was she not given her account back, but she was then put onto a number of small accounts, all of which were on, to use their termin terminology, red alert status due to previous mismanagement by another staff member. And so effectively, she, on her return from maternity leave, she was set up for failure. And this example was only from a few years ago. And this is a textbook example of what's called the motherhood penalty that many mothers may face throughout their employment. And it's part of a series of entrenched behaviors and attitudes that are a cause of the gender pay gap. Now, I started uh, my uh, working life in London in the mid-1990s, and sometimes it feels like in some areas we have moved on, but in some areas we maybe haven't moved on as quickly as I certainly would like them to. In my first job at a systems integrator, I appeared in a league table which was pinned to the break room wall. Best work performance? No. Sadly not, it was a ranking of the sexual attractiveness of all the junior female employees at the company. In taking evidence on the Economy Committee for this report, my colleagues and I heard detailed testimony about the ways women are still put on unequal footing in the workplace today. And the motherhood penalty that I've just mentioned is only one example of that. According to the PwC report, three in five professional mothers that return to the workforce are likely to be moved into lower skilled or lower paid roles with total earnings being reduced by a third. This phenomenon sees a disproportionate amount of women taking on part-time roles and foregoing professional advancement. This gender pay gap is the undeniable embodiment of a workplace culture where women are systematically undervalued and unduly limited. And these limitations must be dismantled if the gender pay gap is to truly be reversed. And the Economy Committee report sets forth a number of recommendations that aim to do just that. For instance, we heard that the motherhood penalty would diminish if changes were made to flexible working and also to childcare provision. A demand for flexible jobs, which is quite outstripped by supply, is causing a talent bottleneck that has had an adverse effect on working mothers, forcing them into part-time jobs they're overqualified for and do not necessarily want. But flexible working, on the other hand, enables people to tend to, for example, caring responsibilities, but without sacrificing their earning potential and their professional advancement in the process. This also has business benefits as well, as flexible working has been shown to boost labor market participation and also productivity. The committee heard that we also have in the UK a 1.5 breadwinner model and I would like to see us moving away from that model. Now, I've spoken quite a bit already about motherhood and how that links into the gender pay gap, but of course, the gender pay gap is an issue that affects all women, women with children and also women who don't have children. And the committee report notes that little change has been made in easing occupational segregation in things like uh, the modern apprenticeships. 
female starts in engineering, construction and automotive in 2015-16 did not break higher than 6%. Colleges Scotland stated that they thought this had less to do with the apprenticeships themselves and more to do with societal attitudes. And that's why I think we need to do more on early interventions into children's life in order to prevent this gendering of occupations. SSE had a really good example of this as they created their own picture book for children. And this features a female engineer. It's then brought into primary schools by female engineers who then talk to the children about their work. Engender also testified before the committee. They spoke of a leaky pipeline of women and girls in the hard sciences. And really, we need to put strategies into place to foster greater and more sustained female involvement in these currently male-dominated fields. And the City of Glasgow's College Women in Construction and women into engineering courses are really good examples of what can be achieved in that area. Occupational segregation persists outside of the hard sciences as well, with women holding only 50% of the positions in finance, but they're concentrated into the lowest paying jobs. There are more women than men now in the law sector, but only 28% of partners are female. And if women do break into tech, my example earlier from my own life, engineering and construction, there's this double glass ceiling effect, which sees only 12% of females rising to management in those fields. I can see I am running out of time, presiding officer, so I will just say that the, the report forward mentioned that at the present rate of progress, it's going to take us 140 years globally to close the gender pay gap. I think everybody in the chamber would agree that that is not acceptable. And I look forward to the government taking action on some of the recommendations that were in the committee's report. Can I say to members that any extra time taken will affect their own colleagues later on? And I call Oliver Mundell uh, to be followed by Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, may I begin by adding my thanks to those already given by other members to the committee and all those who've contributed to this report on the gender pay gap. It's a very worthwhile, substantive and wide-ranging piece of work. And I have no doubt that given the clear cross-party support for a number of the recommendations brought forward, that the work of the committee will ensure that Scotland continues to be a leader in this area. And be it in no doubt, we must make sure that happens. This issue is so vital, so important, and goes to the right, right to the fundamental issues around fairness, equality, and the kind of society in which we want to live. If we cannot address these issues and ensure that everyone, irregardless of gender, has the same opportunities throughout their life, then I think we should all be embarrassed, not just as a parliament, but as a country. That said, and despite some of the worrying and disappointing evidence of continued challenges that the committee heard in the course of their evidence, I do believe we have to recognise and learn from the very significant steps uh, forward that have already been taken. And in doing so, we must pay tribute to the instigators and trailblazers who through the generations and across the decades, and indeed for that matter, over the centuries, have through their own personal commitment, delivered real progress and changed hearts and minds. And as I've said many times in this chamber in other previous debates, I believe that when it comes to issues around gender inequality, issues like the gender pay gap, then we have to be willing to view them within the context of society as a whole and recognise particularly, as other members have referenced, further issues around the representation of women at the highest levels of decision making. That's why, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm particularly delighted that for the first time in the UK, we've seen the roles of head of state, head of government, and head of the judiciary all held by women. And lest we forget, here in our own Scottish Parliament, we also have the first female First Minister in Nicola Sturgeon. And until very recently, uh, all three leaders of Scotland's main parties, or in the interest of uh, the cross-party spirit of this debate, three out of our five party leaders here in this parliament uh, were women. And uh, whilst I recognise Jackie Bailey's continued uh, perseverance with uh, this cause, uh, I'm of course uh, disappointed she didn't put herself forward uh, to make sure uh, that continued. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, these examples, uh, indeed the examples of all women 
uh, in public life and in prominent positions do send out a very strong message of the changes that are already taking place within our society. And whilst we can't ignore that progress, neither is that an excuse to rest on our laurels. And as other members have addressed in this debate, it's not all around equal pay. Um, and as I've alluded to, it is about assuring uh, that opportunities, uh, options and choices are open to all so that both men and women can compete on a level playing field and go to the very top in our society because ultimately that is the only way to address the discrepancy in average pay. It is also, I think, about addressing continued stereotypes and often the self-limiting and underlying factors which discourage particularly women from entering into STEM-related jobs and equally means that a number of men, for various reasons, decide that they do not wish to be involved in the care sector or perhaps would be unwilling to go into primary teaching or nursing. And again, while I understand that some progress has been made in some of those areas and appreciate that, relatively speaking, these barriers are beginning to break down, to find ourselves in 2017 and still have such fundamental challenges within our workforce is somewhat alarming. There is clear evidence of long-term occupational segregation and the committee's report does capture some of that. And I've found particularly uh, within our schools from many of the discussions I've had with teachers over the course of the last year and a half, it's also apparent that far too many young people are taking decisions too early in their school career and their learning journey. And it's those uh, lessons and decisions uh, that they make early on that continue to influence their thinking throughout the rest of their life. It is for this reason and because of the multitude of challenges that exist that uh, making the progress we all want to see is so tricky. There is no single answer, uh, but thanks to the work of the committee and what I believe is a genuine willingness uh, on all sides I believe that we can continue to make significant progress. And we must, uh, because every day that the gender pay gap continues to exist is another day when our economy is underperforming. And more importantly, the underutilization of skills and talents within our society and our country is a crying shame at both the individual and at a national level. Thank you. I call Richard Leonard to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I refer members to my uh, register of interests? Uh, before my election to Parliament, I had the singular privilege of working for nearly 20 years as a trade union organiser for the GMB across Scotland, negotiating pay rises, um, averting redundancies, battling grave injustices like the construction industry blacklisting scandal and securing equal pay uh, for women workers, more often than not low paid women workers. Women workers in supermarkets, in social care in our communities and in factories and offices, in cleaning, catering, caring, in clerical and in cashiering work. My first recourse to an employment tribunal as a union organiser all those years ago was an equal pay case for the head chef at Rosyth Dockyard who discovered that she was getting almost two pounds an hour less than her predecessor. We won. And down the years, I've led and won equal pay cases for cleaners at Longanic Power Station and at Diageo sites across Scotland, where we discovered that there was a janitor's rate of pay, male, a cleaner's rate of pay, female, and a part-time cleaner's rate of pay, female too. As the committee report shows, women make up 76% of all part-time workers in Scotland, so they are amongst the lowest hourly, weekly, monthly and annually paid workers. 20% of all women workers, nearly 300,000 women in Scotland today earn less than the living wage of £8.45 an hour. This compares to 14% of male workers. So to tackle low pay and in-work poverty is also to tackle the gender pay gap. And that's why for the Labour Party, the living wage is a political priority. It's also always been clear to me that work predominantly performed by women is markedly undervalued and underpaid. As the committee was vividly told by one witness, and I quote, 
If the social care workforce in Scotland was more balanced and representative of the community, and, dare I say it, more male-dominated, we would not be a low-paid profession. And so I say to the government that unless we revaluate these jobs in our society and in our economy, and unless we address the scourge of low pay, we will never close the gender pay gap. And there was something else I knew from the outset in my time as a trade union organiser, and that was that working people through their trade unions could achieve much through industrial struggle and occasionally through the courts and tribunals, but real and decisive advance was often made through political action and political decisions. And I spent much of my time in the union toe-to-toe -to -toe with, toe -to -toe -to -toe with some of Scotland's biggest employers, challenging them to pay the living wage. One of the best examples is Diageo, the biggest drinks company in the world, which despite negotiation after negotiation, year after year, record profit after record profit, would not move on the living wage for their lowest paid workers who are employed for them, but not by them. Transferred every few years from Compass to Mighty to Sodexo. These lowest paid cleaning and catering workers, again, a group of predominantly women workers, were treated as second class citizens uh, for too long. So when a representative of Sodexo and a representative of Diageo appeared before the committee as part of this inquiry, I was not surprised to hear them describe how they were committed to the living wage concept. And so the committee decided, and so the committee decided that we should highlight in our report the difference between actual living wage employers and these conceptual living wage employers. And it's there in paragraph 192 of the final report. Actual living wage employers are those who ensure all those working for the business are paid the living wage and conceptual ones are those who support the concept of the living wage but do not actually implement it. So I'm delighted this afternoon to report to Parliament that those low paid workers employed by Sodexo on the Diageo contract on sites across Scotland, those workers who I represented all those years now have it confirmed in writing that by the end of this year, because of political pressure applied in this Parliament, will get the living wage of £8.45 an hour. So, there is a lot we can do in this Parliament. We can devise a national strategy, we can act through public procurement, we can redesign the Scottish Business Pledge, and we can prioritise the social care sector. Because we do have it in our power to tackle the gender pay gap. Because if we are serious about equality and the place of women in society, then this Parliament and this Government must act, not only as a matter of economic imperative, but as a matter of moral imperative too. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak, and I'm very pleased that the committee has chosen to devote uh, a significant amount of time to an inquiry on this topic, and I thank them for their work. I think I'd like to begin by reflecting on a problem that I think our society has in discussing this issue. And it's a problem of a great deal of our focus and attention being drawn to the top end of society, the top end of the economic inequality in our society. Very often, when the gender pay gap is even acknowledged in mainstream media discussions, it is around the, the highest flying business people, or as recently, it's around the massive salaries given to, to TV stars uh, and the, the, the six and even seven figure salaries that a tiny, tiny proportion of people in our society uh, enjoy. Now, obviously, I want the BBC and other big broadcasters to address gender inequality. And if it means that we see a bit less of Andrew Neil on the telly as well, then that's just the icing on the cake. But a, an attention that is only drawn to these tiny number of people at the very top end of our society and its economic inequality will not address the reality of the vast majority of people's real lives. And it came across in something that Oliver Mundell said as well. He said that more women getting to the top, getting to the very top, I think he said, is the only way to address 
the gender pay gap. And as an example, uh, he mentioned that the heads of government, state and the judiciary in this country, in, in the UK, are all now women. Well, if getting women to the very, very top was the best way of achieving this, then we'd be there already, and we're not. I think that example demonstrates that a focus on the very top is not enough to address the wider problem, and I'm happy to give way. Oliver Mundell. No, I, I understand the point Patrick Harvey is trying to make, but I think that's a mischaracterisation uh, of my remarks. I said that having women in these prominent roles, uh, making decisions, being seen to make decisions, being seen to take uh, the lead in our public life, uh, was an import, sent out an important message and probably the strongest uh, message of all. I didn't say it was the only thing uh, that could be done, and I hope he would accept that was the point I was making. Patrick Harvey. Well, if that's what the member intended to say, then I'm, I'm happy to accept that. But I would, I would suggest that sending out that signal may be a nice thing to do, may ha even have some real value. But if we send out the signal that all is right at the top, without fundamentally changing the structural inequalities that exist throughout the rest of our society and the rest of our economy, then we won't really have achieved anything more than a cosmetic change. The economic case for reducing and eliminating the gender pay gap has been touched on by a number of members, and it comes across very strongly in the report. I wonder if it comes across too strongly in the report, because while there is undoubtedly a strong economic case for reducing the gender pay gap, as has been demonstrated time and time again by numerous studies, this is not news, this is something that we know to be the case. Is it really the one argument that we should be relying on more than any? Surely we can agree that gender inequality is in principle wrong and that the gender pay gap is one expression of gender inequality in our society. If a business feels that it's not able to improve its own economic performance by reducing the gender pay gap, that shouldn't be taken as a justification for not taking action. We should be clear about the economic opportunities from reducing and eliminating the gender pay gap, but we should not rely solely or even perhaps prominently uh, on that economic argument for doing something which is the right thing in principle. So I say that the gender pay gap is a symptom of wider societal structural inequalities which themselves matter and require to be addressed. I think Richard Leonard touched uh, on this in talking about the way that we value different kinds of work. The kind of work that women have historically done in a higher proportion than men has been undervalued and is still undervalued. And so simply getting more women, for example, into high value careers in, in the, the STEM industries, for example, great, good thing in its own right. Is it enough? Getting more men to, to think about a, a career in the caring professions, great, good thing in its own right. But is that enough? if those caring professions, which are critically important to our quality of life, are still undervalued and paid less than they ought to be if we want to close that gap? And do the services that we have really genuinely meet the diverse needs of all women, including single parents, 92% of whom are women, including women returning from career breaks who, as we heard earlier, are not necessarily looking for help into the easiest and quickest entry-level job. They're looking to regain and re re return to a meaningful career that they may have left behind before, but only for a period of time. We should be giving them the support that they need as well. Finally, presiding officer, uh, I would make the case that the government's commitment to explore and fund trials of a citizen's income is also a critically important way of addressing those wider structural gender inequalities which feed through into the pay gap by ensuring that all people, women and men, are better able to strike their own balance between learning, working, volunteering, caring and all of the other things that matter in our lives. Thank you very much. May I have Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking Gordon Lindhurst and the Economy Committee for bringing this important motion and its report to Parliament today. I congratulate each of them on the work they've undertaken. 
But like others in this debate, I find it dispiriting that after 13, 18 years of devolution and a range of debates, we must still hold these inquiries and look to close a gap between male and female median earnings that the committee conservatively estimates to stand at 16%. That frustration is mirrored among several prominent female broadcasters in their open letter to the Director General of the BBC, Lord Hall, earlier in this summer, in which they said, and I quote, you have said that you will sort out the gender pay gap by 2020, but the BBC has known about the pay disparity for years. We all want to go on the record right now and call upon you to act now. Deputy Presiding Officer, this Parliament has known about that disparity for the entirety of its existence. It is time for us to act now. The committee rightly pointed to the fact that the extent of the gender pay gap is actually quite hard to calibrate and its causes are difficult to accurately fathom, given particularly the 250 employee minimum threshold for gender pay reporting that exists currently. As such, they rightly recommend that the government adopt a range of indicators to establish patterns, trends, and hidden obstacles to female pay progression in this country. Nevertheless, the committee has given a flavor of the challenge before us. Women continue to be concentrated in low-paid industries and part-time work. In Scotland last year, for example, 40% of women were in part-time work, and that's 78% of all part-time workers in this country while male entrepreneurs in the self-employed workforce appear to have greater ease in accessing capital than their female counterparts. Deputy Presiding Officer, our response to gender inequality in the workplace cannot solely rest on the calibration of pay scales. Since the exchange of human labour began, in it, inbuilt systemic barriers have existed to build an imbalance in opportunities and advantages that women can enjoy at work. So we must take a whole systems approach to reform. As a Deputy Prime Minister, my friend and colleague at the time, Nick Clegg, sought to change the narrative around gender stereotypes at work through shared parental leave. He identified maternity, or even just the potential of maternity, as one of the biggest barriers to women's progression in the workplace. Despite it being against the law, we know that employers still do discriminate against women in recruitment if they are of childbearing age. But it's when children are born that the gap really begins to grow, with women being passed over, as we have heard, for promotion, or else moving necessarily into part-time work. As part of his justification for the policy of shared parental leave, Nick Clegg said, if both sexes are equally likely to take time out of their career to look after young children, and if both are equally likely to go part-time to help them juggle work and home, then employers won't have an excuse for letting women fall behind. It's a fairly simple premise. We can make great progress towards evening out the playing field in the workplace by giving parents this choice and by removing the supposition from employers that a woman in her 20s or 30s is less dependable than a man. But this must walk hand in glove with efforts to change culture and perceptions amongst male workers as well. Indeed, a recent survey by Hayes Recruitment in the UK found that nearly two-thirds of workers say men are less committed to their career if they should take their share of shared parental leave. Now, this parliament will soon have an opportunity to change that culture, but also change the culture of those organisations in public control so that organisational governance reflects wider society through gender balance. We will set a new standard in the Agenda Equality in the Workplace Bill um, sorry, it, through the representation on public boards bill, we will set a new standard in gender equality in the workplace and challenge industry to follow that lead. We also need to do more with childcare and extend the debate far beyond the public funding of ours. The recommendations of the McLean Commission offer a kind of flexibility directed at giving parents a range of options and making it easier for women in particular to re-enter and remain in the labour market. Until we get this right, combined with societal pressures around expectations of motherhood, then they we will continue to fall behind. Presiding officer, the committee's estimate of a 16% gap between male and female earnings that I alluded to at the top of my remarks is more than 10% adrift of the 5% gap that exists in Denmark. 
And whilst that needle has shifted over time, it is clear that our efforts have not been equal to the challenge. Now, I want to be able to go home tonight and look my three-year-old daughter, Darcy, in the eye and explain to her that whatever path she chooses, she can expect exactly the same recognition and reward as her brothers. And that is what this report takes us some of the way to doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to first of all thank everyone from the public sphere who engaged with the committee through their submissions and on social media on their gender pay gap experience. Those testimonies really informed our questioning and the report. And the best reports come out of inquiries where the people of Scotland have been very involved. I'd also like to point to the amount of media interest we got into this issue as a result of an inquiry. Again, when the media pay attention, it means that what we do permeates out into civic society. I was on two call K phone in sessions on this very issue on Radio Scotland and on Women's Hour. Got it in, Jackie. There you go. Talking, and I know that other committee members were interviewed too, and that engagement prompts a national conversation. And that's what this issue desperately needs. Now I want to use my time in this debate to talk about the limitations of the gender pay gap reporting obligations. As we know, there's new reporting legislation from the UK government will affect companies over, over 250 employees. And I remain unconvinced on the effectiveness of that legislation in Scotland for a number of reasons. Most obviously, the legal duty only compels very large companies to report their gender pay gap. And in Scotland, it's SMEs which make up the vast percentage of our economy. Now, as a small, former small business owner, I completely understand the pressures of formal and compulsory reporting puts on a very small business. And I don't think anyone in the committee was arguing for reporting to be made compulsory to all businesses. But we have recommended that the Scottish Government look at how we can better capture a picture of the gender pay gap challenges in our economy. This might possibly be done to... Yes. Mason. Member for giving way on that point, would she accept that a small employer in my constituency who we visited, Page Park Architects, have only about 40 employees and they could produce the gender pay gap figure very easily? Absolutely. I absolutely accept Ms. Martin, that. if you let me just call you back yeah, to your sorry. feet first. No, not at all. I absolutely accept that. And, and actually, we've been having this discussion with Ash Denham about where the threshold should be. I don't think it's exactly an onerous thing to do. It's certainly the right thing to do. Um, and I was th thinking that this might possibly be done through existing channels. For example, might a gender pay gap report be asked for in a public procurement situation or in a Scottish enterprise or high account management situation? If a company wants access to tender for public contracts or business support, then adding stipulations and fair work reporting is not a new idea. I would suggest that business behaviours may change as a result, because like it or not, although we might be convinced of the business benefits of closing the gender pay gap, many companies still aren't. The effect of this would reach even further if there were demands on the supply chain from those from procurement contracts too. But reporting can just reveal the problem, as the legal duty to report doesn't compel companies to put any kind of action plan in place if the gap is significantly wide. And this was apparent in one employer that I, I visited who were concentrating on getting the report together itself, but had not given any thought to what they might do to address what was in that report going forward. In our report, we not only encourage all businesses reporting to create an action plan, but ask the government to give them guidance on what that action plan could include. And I suggest any company looking to address their gender pay gap could do a lot worse than reading our committee's report or viewing some of the evidence given to us by organisations such as Close the Gap and Gender, Women's Enterprise Scotland or the Fair Work Convention. And I'd like any guidance that the, the government may introduce on this to be rolled out to all businesses, not just those of 250 plus employees. My colleagues have talked about some of the report's findings on why closing the gap is important and what mechanisms um, many companies have used that have been affected in closing the gap. And I'm not going to list them all again. The companies doing all these progressive, fair and innovative things, the right things, as Patrick Harvey has said, were enthusiastic about what it meant for them and their employees. But we need to recognise that for some reluctant employers, a business and financial argument, one which I'm confident will be compelling, needs to be made. A company without a gender, gender pay gap is a better performing company. It attracts and keeps talent. It has diversity of approaches, views and skills that makes your work and products better. Just these two things have a massive effect on the bottom line. 
It's the right thing to do, but for those for whom, for whom that's not a motivating factor, and let's face it, there are some people out there like that, it's also the smart thing to do. In closing, I want to say to those companies who have closed the gap and who are working hard to close the gap, spread the word on the financial and business benefits. Analyze your bottom line improvements and tell the world. Gender pay gap reporting is in its, it isn't in itself the answer, it's you who is the answer. Not only we should ensure it's reputationally and socially unacceptable to not have a pay gap, we should make it as clear as we can that it's also not good business. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Halker Johnson to follow by Ivan McKee. Mr Halker Johnson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, Deputy, sorry, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome this opportunity to speak about the uh, Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee's recent report. As a new addition to the ranks of the committee, I was not directly involved in the gender pay inquiry, but I'm pleased to congratulate my fellow members on the body of work they've produced and on the contributions they've made today. Um, I welcome the uh, con continuing work to address the historic injustice of the gender pay gap and of unequal pay between men and women. There can be few things as transparently unfair as failing to be paid the same money for doing the same job, not because of what you do, because of who you are. But the focus of the committee went wider than this. The differences in opportunities, or at least perceptions of opportunities, that have clear gendered element, the distinctions of types of occupation that still affect even our youngest generation of working people, and the particular issues around having a family and the choices that people can make. There have been some significant progress in recent times. From years, this year onwards, larger businesses will be obliged to publish their gender pay gap figures, a significant step in increasing transparency and ensuring that where issues exist, they are addressed. At the very top end of the employment market, the proportion of women on FTSE 100 boards has more than doubled since 2011. But in the wider economy, women have often found themselves pushed into lower paying jobs. There are several possible explanations from sharing financial responsibilities to issues around skills, and I intend to touch on that in a moment. We know that for many of these women, increases to the national living wage and taking many out of paying income tax altogether have provided an additional degree of financial security. But the question of occupational segregation remains significant. To take one example, which has been covered already today, the number of women entering STEM jobs remains worryingly small, despite the often higher pay and opportunities these profession, the professions can provide. There is precious little evidence that this will be remedied in the near future. Physics, computing, and other technical subjects still see a low level of involvement from young women in schools. If anything, this seems to drop off by the time they have reached university, colleges, or apprenticeships. We've seen cuts to STEM education in recent years, and it must be as clear as day that we require more STEM teachers in Scotland and work to reverse some of the harm done to our colleges. But as well as that, more girls must be involved in STEM from the earliest ages. To achieve that, STEM subjects must be promoted as a viable career option for young women. This requires closer working between schools and industry and a far greater focus on careers guidance. Often very blunt gender stereotypes are typically in place for children at a very early, very early age, which can determine what careers children look towards. We can only address this problem by tackling it at a similarly early age, ensuring that all children are open to the breadth of careers that are available to them. This is part of a slightly wider pond. To what extent does our current careers guidance prepare young people effectively for work? To what extent are technical and scientific professions promoted and their roots into them other than university? I therefore look forward to the Scottish Government's STEM strategy, which is due for publication soon. But if we are to see change within a generation, the work must commence quickly and be radical rather than piecemeal. Scottish Conservatives have also previously raised concerns about diversity in the modern apprenticeships programme in Scotland. Gender differences arise not only across the scheme as a whole, but also when broken down to individual frameworks. Some of the very traditional divisions remain. The committee noted that little progress had been made here, and by some measures it is getting worse. The delivering the young workforce target to reduce 60% the percentage of modern apprenticeship frameworks where the gender balance is 75-25 or worse by 21, 2021 is far from ambitious, yet there seems to be problems in making modern steps in that direction. Perhaps the rollout of foundation, foundation apprenticeships across Scotland and the closer links with schools, uh, schools presents an opportunity to challenge that dynamic. A feature of the Economy Committee's inquiry was evidence that the problems leading to women receiving lower pay, lower pay more present, uh, sorry, are more present in the Highlands and Islands than in Scotland as a whole. Highlands and Islands Enterprises' submission showed gender segregation of careers and sectors, 
were more pronounced in the region. High's research also showed that women are still more aware of jobs in sectors that are perceived to be lower paid. The contribution that under, underemployment along women has, sorry, amongst women has to differences in pay is also compounded in more rural areas, with high pointing to multi-occupational work and the level of part-time and seasonal employment as being significant. The work that High is, is taking forward is welcome, but it's clear that the roots behind several of these issues begins at an earlier point, and that we need schools, businesses, enterprise agencies, and other public bodies, uh, other public sector bodies, to have a more unified focus if we are truly to commit to seeing change. Other components that I welcome is the Digital, uh, Digital Scotland publication, tackling the technology gender gap together, which High Skills Development Scotland and other bodies are working together on. It makes many of the points that I have spoken about today, and its conclusions are very much worth looking at. However, I do question whether the identified problems are being addressed for Scotland's young people in practice, and the level of resource being directed. So to conclude, many of these long-standing problems will require real focus and resources to address. The benefits, however, will not just flow to individuals, but the wider economy too. Again, I thank the committee for its report. Thank you. I call Ivan McKee, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I would like to thank the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for the work they've done in leading an investigation into this very important topic and for the comprehensive report they have produced. And as Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, I take great interest in all the work of the committee and in particular such a key subject area as this. The potential impact to the economy of balancing the gender pay gap has been well documented. A figure of potential increase in GDP of 17 billion to the Scottish economy is given in the committee's report. This of course assumes there would be no gender displacement and that women entering the workforce or increasing their hours would not displace men currently in those roles. And I think it's a reasonable assumption given the growing skill shortages we currently see in the labour market as highlighted in the report, and this is a deficit set to increase, obviously, as a consequence of Brexit. As the report highlights, there are definitional issues around quantifying the gender pay gap, use of mean or median, weekly or early, with or without overtime, and the impact of lower early rates for part-time work all make quantification, and hence international comparisons, difficult, something that requires more work. We need to understand who in the world is better at this and to seek to learn from them. One thing we can see is wide variations in the data. There's a clear age-related impact, with the pay gap being significantly smaller for age groups under 40 than those above. Whether this is a persistent phenomena, a consequence of maternity leave and return to work barriers, or a positive trend, such as we see greatly increasing numbers of young women entering professions such as the law, which will consequently impact on older age cohorts in coming decades, is not yet clear. This is one area where more understanding <coughs> would be valuable. While examples of pay inequality, with women being paid less than men for the same or similar work, still exist, the key drivers of the gender pay gap are highlighted as being around occupational segregation, gender variations in part-time employment rates, and differential promotion rates. Occupational segregation, as the report highlights, is often a consequence of gender-based stereotypes which can influence from an early age impacting career choices. My own four children, a lawyer, a vet, an engineer and an economist, and no prizes for guessing which two are the girls, an epic fail in the McKee household, so don't go taking any lessons from me on gender career stereotypes. But despite my own failings, this is an area that requires focus. Women are expected to go into the caring professions <coughs> and men into technical work. The focus on women into STEM careers is critical, although this, despite this focus being on the agenda for some considerable time, in many areas limited progress has been made. In my own engineering class, only 10% were women, and gender balance was well understood even then as an area where improvement was needed. 35 years later, and progress has been limited. However, the experience of the law in some medical disciplines shows that progress can and has been made in some areas. But this is a two-way street. More women into STEM means more men into traditionally female-dominated jobs, for example, in the care and early learning sectors. As the report highlights, 
Seeing more men in the traditional female-dominated career type roles will help us to break the ideological link between women and care or the idea of the female as caregiver. And the assumption that lengthy child-rearing career gaps for women are inevitable is another outdated gender stereotype that needs to be challenged. As the report points out, in Scotland in 2016, 8% of women aged 16 to 64 were economically inactive because they were looking after the house or the family, compared to only 1% of men. I was fortunate enough when my own children were preschool to be working a shift pattern that allowed me to take on responsibility for much of our childcare, while Mrs McKee returned to full-time work. Most are not so fortunate. The report also raises other important issues, such as flexible working or encouraging female entrepreneurship, work I'm happy to support as part of the Women in Enterprise cross-party group. In summary, presiding officer, I welcome this report and there are some clear areas where more understanding of the data and the steps we need to take to make progress is required to enable us, us to deliver the societal changes and the economic benefits of closing the gender pay gap. Thank you very much. With a little time in hand, I give all the closing speakers an additional minute. I think you'll have no difficulty with that, Ms Bailey. I ask you to close for Labour, please, up to seven minutes. <coughs> Sorry, I wasn't meaning. You yeah, went down the wrong way. <coughs> Let me just say, I'm not the first woman today to have a coughing fit. The other one was slightly longer. <coughs> Presiding officer, take, take a moment. Take it's a moment. okay, I, and I don't need a I don't need a lozenge either. But presiding officer, speaker after speaker has acknowledged that women's employment is more precarious than men's. We are the part-time, low-paid workforce. Many of us on zero-hours contracts and employed in the gig economy. More likely to be consumers of public services, more likely to be in poverty, more likely to be in receipt of social security benefits. And for far too many women, underemployment, working well below their qualification level. That is such a waste of talent and a waste for our economy. As I said earlier, closing the gender pay gap would inject £17 billion into the Scottish economy. That matters even more now because of the fiscal framework. Because if we do not sustain the same or higher levels of growth than the rest of the UK, then we might be on the end of a block grant reduction. So let's take a year-on-year -year comparison. Scotland's economy grew by 0.2% over the last year. The equivalent UK growth was 1.5%. This may have serious implications for what we receive through the block grant, and I don't think the Scottish Government have woken up to that. So closing the gender pay gap would be a no-brainer if we're serious about the economy and about our long-term finances. The causes of the pay gap are common across the world, but some have been better than us at closing that, that gap. Belgium, Luxembourg, Norway, to name but a few. We need to understand what they do that works and copy them unashamedly. Let me highlight some of the key recommendations that many have touched on across the chamber. Firstly, a national strategy with an action plan and measurable targets. It makes sense when you have a complex and interconnected set of problems that you need to have a plan. The response from the government is to have a scoping exercise to determine feasibility. It is a little weak. Why can't you just say yes, there will be a national strategy and then work through what it needs to cover? Secondly, there is the role of enterprise agencies. Women are 49% of startups, but 3.4% of growth companies. For years, research undertaken by Women's Enterprise Scotland and others has pointed to the need for gender-specific support for women-led businesses, but it really hasn't been provided. If GDP in Scotland reflected women starting up in business at the same rate as men, then we would contribute £7.6 billion to the Scottish economy. What's not to like about that? The Scottish Government has pledged to double the Women's Enterprise budget. It's only £200,000 at the moment. Just think what we could do if we gave them more money, never mind mainstreaming consideration for women's enterprise and tackling women's economic inequality as part of our enterprise agencies. And whilst on the enterprise agencies, we should put our money where our mouth is. 
the Scottish Government should redesign the business pledge is not fit for purpose on gender equality. And for those businesses that get millions of pounds in regional selective assistance, we should be asking for gender pay gap reports and action plans as standard. I don't think the Scottish Government's response agreed to this. Where is the political will and the priority in this? If we don't embrace these recommendations, presiding officer, little will change. Gillian Martin was right to talk about the limitations of gender pay gap reporting as proposed by the UK government. The Scottish economy is made up by majority of companies with less than 250 employees, so the new requirement to report the gap won't touch them. She was also right to ask how we could use procurement or even enterprise agency account managed companies to make a difference. I'm not sure I saw a really positive response from the Scottish Government on that. Close the gap, tell us that existing responses to tackling the pay gap are insufficient. They, together with Engender, are very clear about the need for a national strategy. So tell us, Minister, are you going to do this? I said the Scottish Government's response was weak. I'd rather be wrong about that. Um, and let me tell you why, because your response refers to the Fair Work Convention, it refers to inclusive growth, the enterprise agency activity, the business pledge, all in, in, in and of themselves positive initiatives, but they do not really engage with tackling the gender pay gap. So let's get behind the committee report. It is bold, it is ambitious, it's challenging to us all. And I want the Scottish Government to be equally bold and ambitious. We have a chance to change this for generations of women. But you know, if you just want to carry on as before, it'll be 140 years before we close that gap. And frankly, Minister, our daughters can't wait that long. Neither can our economy. My goodness, you didn't use the entire seven minutes. There's a start. Oh, no, thank you. Can I just remind members that the use of you and yours, you speak in this parliament through the chair, and it's just a little habit we're all slipping into, which you're going to slip out of. Can I now call upon Alison Harris, please, to close the Conservatives up to seven minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, in closing this debate for the Scottish Conservatives, can I say just how apparent it is that across this chamber, members are united in our determination to close the gender pay gap, even if there are slight differences in how that is to be achieved. At the outset, can I also pay tribute to my colleague, Gordon Lynnhurst, and to all the members of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for working so diligently to produce the report before us. The Scottish Conservatives welcome both the report and the recommendations. Women in the workforce continue to be concentrated in low-paid industries and part-time work. We share the view of many of those individuals who, who tweeted their opinion from valuing women's work means recognising the value of women's contributions to the economy to when women thrive, we all benefit and many other contributions that were made. Likewise, many of the contributions that have been made today by the speakers across the chamber have highlighted a lot of aims that many of us share to close this gender pay gap. We heard from Jamie Halcrow Johnson on the evidence that the gender pay gap is particularly marked in the Highlands and Islands. Dean Lockhart pointed out that the gender pay gap is not a unique problem to Scotland. Oliver Mundell highlighted the value of seeing women occupying leading and public roles. Jackie Bailey expressed concern at the state of the Scottish economy, stating that if growth suffers, this affects the gender pay gap. Ash Denham mentioned the PwC report and the motherhood penalty, something that I will come back to later on in my speech. Alex Cole Hamilton discussed a whole systems approach to gender discrimination. And many other speakers, too many to mention individually, made very valid and useful points, though some points I felt we could not actually really agree with. However, not only is closing the gap the right thing to do, as Patrick Harvey said, but the potential economic benefits of doing so are being highlighted by a number of bodies, including the CBI Scotland, who in their evidence to the committee wrote, Closing the gender pay gap increases the competitiveness of individual companies and the profitability of the economy as a whole. This view, together with further anecdotal evidence, is positive. 
But as the committee notes, more study needs to be done to confirm the correlation between bottom line improvements and closing the gender pay gap. And again, we welcome that. Further proposals put forward by the committee in areas such as the creation of a more gender diverse apprenticeship programme for those returning to work are positive steps in the right direction. Similarly, we hope that the Scottish Government will note the committee's recommendations on calls to boost the number of public sector jobs offering flexible working hours, on more recognition of the role of the care sector, on more emphasis on getting enterprise agencies to address gender pay issues in their sectors. In a country in which only 20% of SMEs are owned by women, asking the Scottish Government and its agencies to review the funding streams available to new and existing female entrepreneurs is very welcome, particularly in light of anecdotal evidence that male entrepreneurs are more successful in obtaining capital than females. Deputy Presiding Officer, we have heard other speakers highlight, as a nation, we need to do more to encourage more girls into, to study science and technology subjects. With women holding only 18% of jobs in well-paid technology sector and a mere 9% in engineering, huge scope exists for girls who are able to study these subjects. In 2015, Education Scotland highlighted that girls made up only 20% of advanced higher computing and 28% of the then new higher physics course. These figures are disappointing and also what is disappointing is the low uptake by girls in STEM subjects in both college and university places, contributing to a gross underrepresentation by women in well-paid jobs in these sectors. Other speakers have highlighted caring issues as a further reason for the gender pay gap. Whether of children or sick or elderly relatives, providing care is still very much a role played by women. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many employers fail to recognise this and continue to show a lack of flexibility in working hours leading to more women seeking part-time work. A particularly troubling section in the report refers to what is described as the motherhood penalty. This being the pay gap between working mothers and women without dependent children, which can cause the pay of returning mums to fall behind other women by as much as 11%. On this issue, I found the comments to the committee from Family Friendly Working Scotland to be particularly salient. As are the words of Professor Loretto, when he highlights the issue of work choices of grandparents of working age being affected by taking on caring roles. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives see this report as a starting point. We are supportive of the recommendations that have been made and look forward to the Scottish Government and all sectors of our economy, both public and private, building on these recommendations to do their bit to close the gender pay gap. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Janie Hepburn to close the government seven minutes or thereabouts. Minister, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, begin by thanking members for their uh, contributions uh, today? I, I think there's been a broad uh, agreement. Uh, I want to make very clear uh, that I don't think anyone in this chamber, not least the Scottish Government, is not uh, serious about this uh, agenda. I regret it if Jackie Bailey feels her response has been weak. She's entitled to her perspective. Uh, of course, it is uh, entirely incumbent upon, and I would expect her to be pushing us uh, to do more. I've uh, had a look over again how we have responded to the recommendations of uh, the committee. And my observation would be that uh, virtually all of the committee's recommendations uh, tally entirely with the work that we are taking forward. Now, clearly, there will be areas that um, we can look at uh, again, and I'll always be uh, willing to do that. But let me agree with uh, Jackie Bailey, uh, the point that she made that there is an important uh, reason for us to be engaged uh, in this uh, agenda. She referred to her uh, daughter, uh, Alec O'Hammond, to refer to his. I have a daughter as well, and I, I don't want her to grow up in a society. Uh, let, no, let me pause it in a positive sense. I want her to grow up in a society where there is no uh, gender uh, pay gap. That's my uh, aspiration for her, for all of our uh, daughters. Of course, some of the, uh, the, uh, the issues that uh, uh, persist are uh, entrenched, uh, they are long-standing, they are attitudinal. Uh, it starts very early uh, when 
our children are very young. I, I have to say, I thought you've, Ivan McHugh's probably been a little hard on himself. So I'm sure he's very proud of all uh, of the achievements of his children. But I would uh, suspect that even uh, all of us who have spoken in this debate, who are, I believe, totally and utterly committed to uh, the agenda we have spoken about today, uh, President Officer, will ourselves be susceptible to lapsing into uh, using language, uh, providing toys and all the rest of it that sometimes reinforce those gender stereotypes. So we always have to uh, remind and start with ourselves that uh, we uh, must uh, seek to uh, avoid to do that. Let me pick up on some of the issues in the time I have available that have been raised in, uh, the, in the debate. Uh, Dean Lockhart uh, mentioned the, the UK government's private sector gender pay gap uh, regulations. I, I would welcome them as at least an acknowledgement about the systemic pay inequality that women experience. But I would agree uh, with Gillian Martin and Jackie Bailey, they are not in of themselves likely to drive the change we need. They are rather limited in terms of uh, the threshold of 250 uh, employees, uh, which will exclude the vast majority of um, private sector companies and most third sector organisations here uh, in Scotland. Uh, clearly, we are not able to alter uh, that legislation as reserved, but what we can do is lead by example, we have a, a significantly lower threshold for our uh, public uh, agencies here in Scotland. Uh, Gillian Martin, Jackie Bailey spoke about the uh, efforts we could be taking through our enterprise agencies uh, around uh, the provision of regional selective assistance grants or uh, account managed uh, companies. Uh, we are uh, going through an enterprise and skills review uh, right now. What I will say is that we are at place to continue to explore with our agencies how we can uh, increase the number of uh, businesses who produce pay gap uh, reports. Uh, we are looking at that in a very serious fashion, but what they can do right now, of course, is signpost businesses to uh, relevant guidance available. Uh, for example, Close the Gaps uh, Think Business uh, Toolkit, which uh, is available to, to all uh, companies of all uh, uh, sizes. And I'll come back to that uh, in a short moment uh, around why uh, talking about this in economic terms is, from my perspective, important. Ash uh, Denham mentioned the, the motherhood uh, penalty. We, uh, I'm acutely aware of some of the uh, issues that drive that. That's why uh, we have established a, a, a working group to take action to uh, 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 tackle pregnancy and maternity discrimination. It's a, a group that I uh, chair involving uh, many of the inquiry witnesses, uh, the NHS, Police Scotland, the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission, it's why we've established a, a women returners program. I would accept, willingly accept it is uh, limited at this stage. It is designed to pilot uh, initiatives so that we can see uh, good uh, practice. I have to say right here and now, it will not be, it'll never be something that the government can lead in its entirety. We're going to have to require all sectors, particularly the private sector, to be willing to step up to the place. What we want to do from these pilots is uh, uh, get good practice so that we can work with employers to see more support for women uh, to return to the, the workplace. Alison Harris spoke about uh, very briefly, yes. Oh, Dean Locker, I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, does the Minister agree with Audit Scotland that the cuts to 152,000 college places have impacted women's ability to return to work? Minister. Well, we have, of course, set out our uh, clear commitment to uh, support the uh, full-time equivalent place at 116,000. That's what we've done. We, uh, you know, just this uh, earlier last month, uh, rather, not this month, last month, I announced a flexible workforce development fund, which will allow uh, employers to come forward uh, to support those who need to be upskilled in the workplace. Many women will benefit by that. We've refocused individual learning counts to individual training account, accounts which can be delivered through the college network which can be designed to uh, support the upskilling of those who are uh, uh, those women who are uh, low paid. Alison Harris spoke about uh, the need to support uh, flexible working. Uh, that is an agenda that we are uh, signed up to. We fund and participate in family friendly working. Scotland she referred to the, uh, the recommendation by the committee that uh, we as a, a government, uh, uh, our agencies it also refers to the Scottish Parliament. I don't think the presiding officer would uh, like me to veer into what the Scottish Parliament might do. I'm sure the parliamentary authorities will reflect the recommendation as well. But it uh, asks uh, for all of us to ensure roles are advertised as flexible, agile or part-time, unless there's a good business reason not to do so. All Scottish Government uh, staff, including senior ser civil servants, are encouraged to participate in our flexible working hours. A scheme we require our managers to consider all 
flexible working requests objectively and with its sensitivity. Let me, uh, there is much more I wanted to say, and I'm not going to be able to say it, but I do want, and I think it's important to reflect on two. You do have some time and give you another two, two minutes and more. Well, let me just get on with it then, President Officer. That's what I'll do. Um, I couldn't I, put it better myself. I, 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 I do. <laughs> Well, thank you, I think, President Officer. I, 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 I do want to touch on the issue of uh, childcare in uh, two ways. First of all, the expansion of uh, ch uh, childcare uh, that we have as an agenda is in of itself going to uh, support many more families to be able to uh, better balance their work and caring responsibilities. But I want to assure Jackie Bailey, I utterly recognise the economic opportunity not just in, uh, for those who benefit by the childcare themselves, but also by those who provide uh, the childcare. Uh, we uh, have provided local authorities additional uh, money, £21 million, to invest in their uh, first phase of the workforce expansion this year. We've got a, a commitment to see an additional 435 graduates working in nurseries in the most deprived communities by August 2018. In, in a second, Ms Bailey, to support this commitment and providing £1.5 million of additional funding to the uh, Scottish Funding Council to increase teacher training and childcare related graduate places. Skills Development Scotland are providing training opportunities uh, for childcare. We have a commitment to pay the living wage to all those delivering uh, funded entitlements. So I don't want anyone to be under the impression that this is not a sector I take seriously. And in uh, relation to Patrick Harvey's uh, language, I uh, don't want to undervalue that sector. Perhaps we need to switch some of the language we use. Instead of talking about how the sector is undervalued, let's see how we, let's show leadership in this chamber and let's see how we value the sector and we'll deliver uh, as an administration. I give way to Ms Bailey. Jackie Bailey. Um, can, can I invite the Minister to show leadership, make this a key growth sector that is the responsibility of our enterprise agencies as well? I'm happy to speak to Minister. enterprise agencies. I suppose the point I would make this is a whole system uh, 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 commitment and our skills agencies uh, are uh, engaged in this area. I want to, and I'll probably have to close on this point. I yes, you will. You are. Uh, uh, presiding officer. Richard Leonard was quite right to identify uh, the need for us uh, to tackle uh, low pay. We've done very well in Scotland in terms of 80% uh, of our population is paid at least a living wage or more. But I utterly recognise that remaining 20% uh, uh, is who we need to focus on now. And that does uh, represent uh, women in low paid work more uh, than men. We are promoting the living wage. I want to see uh, more than an unprincipled commitment to paying uh, the living wage. I want to see a real hard and fast commitment. I think Mr. Uh, Leonard might have been referring to something else in uh, those uh, comments, but I'll uh, let that uh, stand. Let me finish yes, utterly do now. on the final point, President Officer. Uh, Patrick Harvey was right to say about the intrinsic good and self-evident worth of closing the pay gap. I totally agree with that point, but it is important we talk about it in terms of an economic imperative, and it's very much the same with the Fair Work agenda when we talk about payment of living wage, flexible working, uh, involvement in the workplace it increases retention, reduced absenteeism, increased productivity, closing the pay gap can achieve the And same. there we must end or you're cutting into the committee so summing up. No, saying, I agree no Minister, with no, Martin, and I no agree Minister, with thank you very, very, very much. I call on John Mason, please, to close for the committee up to 4.58, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, for protecting the back benchers against the front benches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I, can, can I also uh, just start off on a very consensual note by thanking everyone who has taken part in the debate today, but also to emphasise uh, our thanks as a committee for the wide range of witnesses who took part uh, at the committee. We spent a considerable amount of time on this. We also went out and visited in subgroups quite a number of businesses all around the country, uh, and that was tremendously helpful, certainly for myself. Uh, can I also thank Spice for their help, for the clerks, uh, but particular mention too for our advisor, uh, Jane Gotts, who had a uh, tremendous input uh, into the whole committee. Now, I think it would be fair to say that most of today's debate has been broadly consensual, and that would be true of the whole study that we did uh, in the committee. I mean, it has to be accepted that uh, some committee members are more consensual than others, and I shall leave it to members to decide uh, who I might be referring to. If I can uh, start off with a few points generally that the convener on behalf of the committee was not able to spend a lot of time on, and then I would like to mention uh, some of the individual contributions that people have made. 
Uh, firstly, occupational segregation, which has been mentioned by a number of people, including uh, Close the Gap, uh, in their response. And throughout its inquiry, the committee has sought to understand the challenges that women working across both the public and the private sector still face. And as the convener said in his remarks, the pay gap impacts on women at all stages of their working lives. And the committee heard many reasons for this. Occupational segregation is a key factor in causing the gender pay gap, with women historically clustered in sectors traditionally low paid, sometimes called the five C's, cleaning, caring, catering, clerical, cashiering, and this pattern sadly continues. There are fewer women in higher paid sectors, such as engineering, IT, technology, and Equate Scotland told the committee, as I think has been referred to, that only 18% of technical jobs and 9% of engineering jobs are held by women, and Alison Harris eh, made quite a reference to that. The committee heard quite a lot about the leaky pipeline, and if people don't look at anything else in the report, it's worthwhile looking at these two infographics, which talk about how, even when we start off well, there is a drift eh, through the system, and women, especially if they take a career break, can fall out of certain sectors. STEM is an area with high paying jobs and increasing opportunities, so plugging this leaky pipeline is an essential part of reducing the gender pay gap. <clears throat> Some of the factors witnesses said caused leaks throughout the pipeline are starting school when very early young children are saying that there are boys and girls jobs, lack of role models in the STEM industries with fewer women in senior positions, and of course difficulties, as has been said, in returning to the workforce. Now, apprenticeships has been mentioned by a number of people, including the Minister and Jamie Halcrow Johnston, and the committee noted the successes of the modern apprenticeship model in providing opportunities for young people and employers alike. But despite considerable efforts, little progress has been made in addressing occupational segregation with the modern apprenticeship system. For example, in 2015-16, there were no female apprentices in the civil engineering specialism within construction, and the committee notes work being done by Skills Development Scotland, which is very much welcomed. The reporting legislation has largely been uh, touched on, particularly by Gillian Martin, who spent most of her speech on that. And uh, we did hear quite a lot of evidence around the fact that the UK will require 250 staff uh, and above to report, but that does leave out rather a lot of people in Scotland, as Dean Lockhart himself mentioned. Targets hasn't been mentioned very much, but we did hear about, about it, and there was certainly, I think, some sympathy on the part of the committee that there should be a bit more in the way of targets, and targets do have value in moving things forward. And then conditions, having conditions on business support and procurement, and the committee heard that there may be an opportunity to address the gender pay gap by placing conditions on economic development aid or procurement in the key sectors of the Scottish economy. <coughs> now, I think Scottish Enterprise and HIE do have a slightly difficult job, so I've got some sympathy for them, but I think we were unhappy about their attitude. I think other groups accepted there was a problem and they wanted to challenge it, but we did at times get the impression from SE especially that they wanted to attract in business and they didn't want to put off business by saying things to them like they had to have uh, more women uh, in their organisation. Can I just touch on some of the things that people have said in the final couple of minutes? Um, Gordon Lindhurst particularly emphasised uh, the difficulties of measuring the gap and that this is complex, and I was glad that the Minister uh, appreciated and agreed with that point uh, as well. Uh, Jackie Bailey, in her two speeches, uh, talked, was perhaps one of the more aggressive uh, speakers. Sorry, just a minute and there. I can't hear what the member is saying for uh, casual conversations across the chamber. Thank you. I realise I'm keeping members from the following debate, but... I was listening. I was listening. Th thank Mr. you, Mr. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, Jackie Bailey did bring up the question of GDP and how we measure that, and uh, Patrick Harvey correctly challenged her about that. That is something the committee will actually be doing, looking at in its coming two uh, mm -hmm. subjects on uh, data and on the performance of the economy. But uh, we have heard already in one of our following uh, studies already clear evidence and a clear statement from a witness that growing the economy does not make it fairer automatically. And uh, I'm certainly a believer that even if the economy didn't grow, uh, we need to make it fairer right where we are right today. Now, other people, uh, including Ash Denham, talked about the positive impact on the economy of having women fulfilling their potential, working to the... Uh, the uh, qualifications that they had. 
uh, Richard Leonard talked about more women uh, being on the living wage and uh, the fact that there are conceptual living wage employers, and that's certainly a point uh, I am very sympathetic with uh, as well. Patrick Harvey, I think, made the point that just putting the Queen at the top of the whole system as head of state doesn't automatically mean that women at the bottom uh, are going to do better, and I think we would probably all uh, agree with that. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton mentioned devolution in particular, but I think we do have to accept there's many issues around this that are not related to devolution and we do not yet have control over. So in my concluding remarks, presiding officer, the gender pay gap is not an issue that can be addressed overnight. Even in Sweden, they're still at something like 13%. It will take time. The committee will continue to monitor this policy area in budget scrutiny work and will carefully consider the Scottish Government's response to its report. There is no doubt that supporting women at all levels and in all sectors to achieve their potential will benefit Scotland's economy. So that would be good for women and that would be good for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate on the gender pay gap. It's now time to move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 8013 in the name of Claire Adamson on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on breach of the Code of Conduct for members of the Scottish Parliament. And I call on Claire Adamson to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointment Committee has considered and reported on a complaint from Christian Allard about Alexander Burnett, MSP. The complaint was that Alexander Burnett, MSP, failed to declare his registered business interests when submitting written parliamentary questions back in August last year. All of the details of the complaint, the committee's deliberations and the commissioner's investigation can be found in the annexes of our report. The complaint alleged that Alexander Burnett MSP had relevant business interests related to a housing development in Bankery, Aberdeenshire. It was the complainer's submission that the conflict of interest arose by virtue of entries in the Respondent's Register of Interest. The Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life investigated the complaint and concluded that Mr Burnett was in breach of the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006 and the Code of Conduct for MSPs. The committee unanimously endorsed the Commissioner's conclusion and furthermore we consider that the breach justifies the imposition of a sanction on Alexander Burnett. The committee wishes to focus its recommended, recommended sanction on the specific breach complained about. Accordingly, it recommends that Alexander Burnett MSB be prohibited from lodging parliamentary questions for written answer for a period of two weeks, which will not overlap with any period of recess. I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate on behalf of the committee that the declaration of registered financial interests in any matter before taking part in the proceedings of the Parliament relating to that matter is an essential aspect of parliamentary transparency and accountability. Furthermore, it is a legal requirement under the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006 and the Code of Conduct for MSPs. Before taking part in any proceedings of the Parliament, a member must always consider whether they have a declarable interest in relation to the particular matter being addressed in those proceedings. It is incumbent on members to make the appropriate written and oral declarations if they have a declarable interest. I move the motion on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Thank you. The question will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8099 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask anyone who objects to say so now or to press the button, I should say. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8099. Formally moved. And no one has asked to speak. Therefore, the question is that we agree motion 8099. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of our a Parliamentary Review motion, I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8098 on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Moved. Thank you very much. We now come to decision time. There are three questions. The first question is that motion 7946 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on gender pay gap be agreed. 
Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 8013 in the name of Claire Adamson on breach of the Code of Conduct for members of the Scottish Parliament be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 8098 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on a committee meeting be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Edward Mountain, and we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.